Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're doing a series of lessons entitled Glimpses of Our God. We're trying to take pictures, ideas about God from Scripture, from inspired sources, and, and try to see how they fit with our understanding and perhaps to expand and grow our understanding of what God is like. This is lesson number six in our series, and it's entitled God the Lawgiver. That might make you a little apprehensive when you first hear it, but let's consider it together. So let's bow our heads together, and I hope you have your Bible handy, because we're going to jump in in just a moment. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that you are the one who has given all law, all good laws, and that you had a very important and rational reason for doing so. Help us to understand it. Help us to understand your role in the giving of the laws and what you intended to teach us through that experience as our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson is about God as a lawgiver. What are the implications of being a lawgiver? And, and sometimes we, we, for, we, we don't stop and think about this, but Technically, in our society, Congress makes the laws, but then the police and other agencies have to enforce them. So now my question is, since we're talking about God, is he both the law giver and the law enforcer? Or does breaking one of God's laws have a natural consequence, which is a kind of enforcement of God's law? I'll choose the latter. You'll choose the latter, okay. Spell, t tell me more. Well, um, I'll give an explanation that I've, that I've given before, but I think it's, it's valid. When I got a new car, in the glove compartment, there was a operator's manual. And in there it said, put gas in the gas tank, oil in the crankcase, water in the radiator, air in the tires. <laughs> if you want this thing to work and to, and to function as it was designed to work. Now, I don't have to do that. I can put peanut butter in the gas tank and sugar in the radiator if I want to. And the, the manufacturer is not going to come and haul me out of my house and execute me on the front lawn. The only thing that happens is my car doesn't work right. And I think that God created us into an orderly universe. The laws of physics and electronics and fluid dynamics that the engineers used to make that car, and they gave me instructions to help me work within those, those parameters, <coughs> are the same ones that, that God used when he created. He created us into an orderly universe that has cause and effect. And gracious and loving God that he is, just like the manufacturer says, I'd like to have this car work for you as long as it can, God gave us some guidelines of how we can relate to him and how we can relate to those around us that will give us opportunity to have the joys and the happiness and the contentment and the fulfillment mm -hmm. that we were designed to have. Now, we don't have to do those things, but if we go kill people, somebody's going to get after us. Stealing from each other is not the best way to, to make good relations, and bad relations usually end up in bad things. So, using the Ten Commandments, as they model from the glove compartment, or use the glove compartment operator's manual as a model for why the Ten Commandments were given, guidelines for our life, mm -hmm. is kind of the model that I like to, okay. to play with. Well, go ahead, Dennis. I would like to approach the same subject and say the same thing from a different perspective, maybe a different metaphor even. Mm -hmm. But if we string out time, we can go back in time before Lucifer rebuilt. And there was harmony throughout the universe. 
we can look forward, given what the Bible has, has pictured as eschatology or whatever. Revelation that, 20, 21, 22. So after the third coming, sometime shortly after the third coming, the universe will be in harmony again. Mm -hmm. I think, jumping to the bottom line, that that is God's agenda. Mm -hmm. That things were in harmony throughout the universe before Satan rebelled, will be in harmony again after this world's history is completed and, and redone. The question uh, comes up, what changed? And I think, it, depending on how much time you want to spend on this, you can look at what happens after the third coming. We ask the question, will sin ever arise again? Mm -hmm. And I think most of us would say no. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, what has changed? Mm -hmm. Certainly sin could. Is our freedom gone? No. Could people sin in the, after the third coming? Yes. We could. We could. Will we? No. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Probably God not. Promises we won't. So what? So what has changed? Mm -hmm. What has happened? Did God change? No. no. God didn't change. But we saw two things. We saw that. We saw what sin really does. What rebellion against God really does. You just have to look at the wars and, and, and all of the atrocities that are carried out through all time on this earth. We say, we don't want sin. And the other thing is, we look at God and we see a different side of God. Mm -hmm. We see a, a, a side of God called grace, mm -hmm. which could not have been seen in any other way. Mm -hmm. That there had to be a rebellion. So when people ask me, did God realize that Satan, that Lucifer was going to be the angel that would rebel in the future before he made them? If we are honest with the data that God knows the beginning from the end, mm -hmm. that God knew that Lucifer would rebel. Mm -hmm. He went ahead and created him anyhow. Mm -hmm. Why? Because in the end, we have a universe which is now more secure. More secure. It's stable. Did, did sin have to occur? No. Sooner or later, it probably would have. I agree with you, mm -hmm. but God did not cause sin. No. He only created us with freedom and the capacity and the ability to sin. Mm -hmm. Created the environment in which sin well, could take place. That is correct. Now, this law that we have, these laws that we, we talk about, are described in the writings of Ellen White as a transcript of God's character. That's in Christ's Object Lessons, page 305.3, 315.1, Great Controversy, 434.1, and other places. What does that imply about these laws? Well, if I may continue okay. one more moment. Okay along the line that Norm is, has, has led us, that God's law describes the minimum requirements, mm -hmm. the minimum requirements to have harmony with our neighbors throughout the universe mm -hmm. forever. It's, it's, it's not some Im arbitrary imposed law, it's what it takes for a community or a society to live in harmony with each other mm -hmm. indefinitely. Yeah. You know, when the law was given from Mount Sinai, there was a point when humanity was completely confused about God. I mean, there was, there was really confusion. And it was almost like a, a show that to the universe when that law was given that it would turn people around and they would use it as a road map to get back to him. Mm -hmm. So so in a way, um, the law was to tell humanity about himself so that they could come. The, well, 
If you hear that Congress is about to pass a new rule, do you say, oh, whoopee, something better for us? Not usually. Not usually. <laughs> no, those kind of laws are kind of made to, um, to deal with the situations. Yeah. I mean, these laws that God gave were laws that were timeless. Well, do you think of laws in general as a restriction on your liberties or a restraint? Mm -hmm. Sometimes for good. Do, do teenagers think that God's laws are protection for them? Not usually. Not usually? Do the young people in your church regard the Ten Commandments as, and I'm quoting, a hedge, a protection, something created for us for our own good? Usually when we're young, it's a little harder to think about the rules like that, isn't it? They don't, they don't seem that way if you have a rebellious nature mm -hmm. and you want to do exactly what you want to do and you don't want anyone to cross your path. Mm -hmm. But if you stop being so self-centered and, uh. you, and you think about, okay, we all have to live here together, mm -hmm. then every single one of those is your safeguard for your well-being. I have a question. Oh, Did the law exist before God even started creating? I mean, God knew that there were elements mm -hmm. around his environment that would lead to guilt and all this other. So before God even created, did these laws exist? Or were the laws as came around as a result of his creation and him trying to explain the Amen. environment? I think it's very interesting that th those laws were never stated or at least not written down in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And not for many, many, many years afterward. Well, if you stop and think about it, if you have one person in the universe and only one, that person can do whatever they want to do and it doesn't matter. They may destroy themselves, but it doesn't matter. So, and, if, and the more people you cram into a relatively small space, the more rules you have to have mm -hmm. in order to live together more or less at peace. But did God have these rules for himself before well, there was any creation? I am reminded, I'm reminding you of what we said a moment ago, that these laws were are a transcript of his character. What does that mean? Did he that have a character before creation? That means he held to these laws. No, these he are, was the, he those He didn't laws. need That's a law. He did. was those laws. He didn't hold to the laws. He was those laws. They well, are a description of what he is and was and will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's the, here's the problem now that we face, where we are in history. 1 John 3, 4, you're all familiar with it. Let me just read it from my Good News translation. Whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law. Or in the King James, sin is the transgression of the law. Now some of you are aware that that's a very free translation. What it literally says is hamartia stin anomia. Sin is lawlessness or rebelliousness. Now Romans 3.23, again a verse that virtually everybody is familiar with who's a Christian, everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. And now we could quote many other passages from the Old Testament and New Testament saying that we're all sinners. Romans 3 is full of passages that point out very clearly that we are all sinners. So, what does that imply? We're all transgressors of God's law? Mm -hmm. Meaning that as human beings, we exist in a world in transgression. Well, you know, we really need to know what God's laws are because even Jesus himself was considered a rebellious person by not following the laws of the church at that time. But he was really following God's laws. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what exactly are God's laws and not what somebody tells us they are. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about actions or are you talking about being connected with the law? Okay, let me give some examples. Exodus 19, I'm going to start with verse 18. The whole of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had come down on it in fire. The smoke of this, uh, I'm sorry, the smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace and all the people trembled 
violently. The sound of the trumpet became louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. I mean, try to imagine that. Here's Moses standing in the front of the group and he says, God, what do you want us to do? Kaboom! And the response is in thunder, you know. So, having said that, look at, look at the response in the next chapter, Exodus 20, starting with verse 18. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. They said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen. But we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Moses replied, don't be afraid. God has only come to test you and make you keep on obeying him so that you will not sin. But the people continued to stand a long way off, and only Moses went near the dark cloud where God was. Now, originally, I mean, having read that, you might have thought, well, Moses is doing fine. But if you go over to Hebrews 12, verse 21, it says, The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling and afraid. Now, you don't get that from the Old Testament, and I'm not sure where Paul got it, or the author of Hebrews got it, but there it is in the Bible, I accept it as true. So, what does this tell us about a lawgiver? He, he got their attention. Maybe he <laughs> needed to get their attention. Yeah. It, you're dealing with a group of people who don't have the slightest idea of the word holy. Mm -hmm. They understand fear, mm -hmm. but they do not understand holy. Okay. So, somehow God is trying to convey to them that I am not your piece of wood in your pocket that you pick up, move around, recarve in a different shape, decide you're going to call me a bug and call that your God. You know, I'm something new. I'm something different. Yeah, this God that you can't control is a problem, isn't he? <laughs> this says more about the people than it does about God. Okay. Mm -hmm. would, would, would you say here that God is laying down the law? Yeah. Uh, probably not. <laughs> probably not. I'd choose other words because I think <laughs> that's, that's why you, I chose those that's words. That's <laughs> because I think those are bad words. <laughs> and you also have the aspect of the, the, the time period is that the most powerful God wins. Mm -hmm. So, part, maybe part of this is God, is God is saying, I am the most powerful God. I want your attention. You'd have thought after ten plagues they would have sort of got it, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, it could have been also answering a question. Um, maybe the angel said, listen, why don't you just show those people your power? Maybe that'll make them turn around. Mm -hmm. And maybe that that might have been one of the reasons why he did it. Well, they found out that it doesn't make any difference. You can show all kinds of power. You can shake everything around them. They still won't end up being perfect or go to him. God, God works with, with the people that he has at the time. He was on top of the mountain with all the thunder here. But for Elijah, there was wind and there was rain and there was fire. But God was in the still, small voice. It depends on who he's dealing with, what he does. And the fact that he would go to this length to try and get the attention of this bunch of rebels, I think says wonderful things about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I After. think Elijah um, thought that maybe that, that power would impress everybody. And that was a revelation it did. to him. On top, of Mount, uh, on top of Mount Carmel, it impressed Yeah, people. but for how long? I mean, it didn't impress um, Jezebel. Didn't impress her at all. She wasn't there. And she too bad. They well, might have still, her too. <laughs> that's still, you know, it didn't impress everybody. Yeah. And then he finds out that it's a still small voice, and he probably sunk and says, oh, "How is that going to do anything?" And he says, "Well, pack your bags. I'm going to show you." And then they left. Well, Elijah had come to the point that he was willing to listen. Well, I want to go back to the Mount Sinai for a moment. Let's suppose that the, the day is at the end. They've just heard the whole thing. I don't know how long the presentation went on. And the families are walking back to their tents. They have managed to get up off their noses and they're walking back. to. What do you think the children said to their parents? 
What happened? They probably walked in silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you say after that kind well, of I, a... <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, um, we went to see fireworks. We all came home crying. <laughs> we were scared to death. <laughs> so I can only imagine. One, one part, when you read the detail in the law, it does make me wonder what kind of people needed that kind of detail. And I'm wondering if maybe a, a number of points in the Ten Commandments, besides all the detail given later, were very path-crossing details. Mm -hmm. Uh, th they were certainly not go and do as you jolly well please from now on. Mm -hmm. it, that, it, was that fear a little bit necessary until they had enough good sense to know why? Do you, do you suppose that many of them said, whoa, this is the kind of lives we've been living and this is what God wants? And there seems to be a discrepancy here. <laughs> you suppose there are enough of them who had that, in that, mu that much insight? Now, there's no talk about the plan of salvation. There's no talk about a cross. <coughs> but Ken, when we speak to our, our children, when they're very young, mm -hmm. and as, as Jane Ann has pointed out, we're watching our two and a half year old grandson mm -hmm. grow up and bump into the boundaries, we don't add a lot of explanation. Mm -hmm. We just say, stay out of the road. Mm -hmm. We say, watch your fingers, leave that alone, mm -hmm. don't touch that, put that back. It's only when they develop more maturity and experience that we give reasons and explanations along with our commands. Which they may not like at that point in time. Well, <laughs> well if they start asking questions, well, that's a good sign. But well, yeah. when they haul their dead dog out of the road from being hit with a car, you can, there's a little education process going on there. But if we don't supply some education to go with it, yeah. they, they see God as uh, very arbitrary and demanding yep. and they rebel. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we, we have provided enough education where they can see and maybe with our 60 years experience we can see yeah God's, God's rules are pretty good. Mm -hmm. They seem to work most of the time. When we in a quiet setting even sit down and read Exodus 20 the Ten Commandments, boom, boom, boom. How do they affect us? How do they affect us? Mm -hmm. Do you see, well, that's fine. I, I, like the young, rich, young ruler, I've, I've done all those things since I was a child up. Well, there's a lot of things you can study and get out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you live your life, you, you read it over and over again, and, and you get more and more out of it. I don't know okay. what else. Jane Ann? If you read the Ten Commandments and you say, okay, everybody around me can do all of these things to me, or I'm going to have to watch all of these things being done, they make a lot of good sense mm -hmm. when you think about everybody in the block walking into your house and taking five things out. Mm -hmm. you, you know. They, they make a lot of good cohabitation sense. Okay. Um, what happens if you read Matthew 5 along with Exodus 20? Does that uh, bother you? Very incriminating. What's Very in Matthew incriminating. 5? Matthew 5 is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I'm going to skip over the Beatitudes because that's not directly related to what we're talking about now. But teachings about the law, starting with verse 17, Jesus says, I'm not come to do away with the law, I'm come to establish it. And then he talks about anger, and he says, you know, even anger is as good as murder. Now he's spelling out what these things are about, talking about adultery 
you know, even if you look at someone from the, of the opposite sex and you want to possess that person, you're committing adultery, teaching about divorce, teaching about vows, don't, don't even, don't say basically anything more than yes or no, you know, mean what you say. Um, these are all expansions on the Ten Commandments, teaching about revenge, and then love for your enemies is not just, you know, don't kill your enemy, it's, you know, love them. And love them the way God loves them. And this is this is not easy to do. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you live in a different planet than I do, but this is for adults. This is for adults. The other was for children. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that God had to to dumb it down. Mm -hmm. I mean, we even refer to them as the children of Israel. That that they were you, were, were just out of slavery. You remind me of a cartoon I saw once, a famous cartoonist, and, and God is there on the top of the mountain in a big cloud, and Moses is there, he's holding the, ten, the tables, the stone of the Ten Commandments, and God says to Moses, no, I can't dumb it down anymore. That's <laughs> 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 just about what we're talking about here, right? Well, he, he could. He said, love God, love man. Yeah. And dumbing it down one notch lower is just love. Is that dumbing? No, I don't think so. But that's the way. <laughs> that's where we're using you, the word. You can, you can use it. You can put it in shorter uh, words, I, I but I don't think you can dumb it down. Okay. Exactly. Actually, actually, what you're doing is make it more abstract. Yeah. Which makes I it a lot true. deeper. But that's why he explained it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could it be that because we as humans are so loveless, that's a big reason why we don't understand God? Because you his mean we might be love. selfish instead of loving? Selfish, yes. <laughs> hmm. But How because could that we be? don't understand love and what love is, therefore we can't understand his law. We now, we don't have the agape love. We as Seventh day Adventists spent a lot of time trying to defend the Ten Commandments. And of course we, we, we talk about defending especially the fourth commandment because that's the one that everybody else seems to want to throw out the quickest. Mm -hmm. And we can go back to Genesis, the first few parts of Genesis, so we can make point out very clearly that we were told to keep the Sabbath way back then. We can go to Genesis 9 after the flood, and it says, well, even Genesis 4, Cain was said, you know, you're not supposed to murder your brother, and, you know, it has consequences. And Genesis 9 says you're not supposed to murder because if you murder, someone will kill you. And, and you can go right through the Old Testament. Many passages, Job 24, Genesis 26, Genesis 20, other places that talk about people who had a clear sense of the requirements of the law, even though it doesn't say specifically this is the you know, Ten Commandments, they had a clear understanding of these laws way before the commandments were given at Sinai. Now, the implications of that are interesting because our Christian friends who don't want to keep the seven-day Sabbath their often argument is, well, these were old Jewish requirements. The Sabbath is for Jews, it's not for Christians. Well, clearly it was given way before there were Jews. Now, what does that say about us on this side of, of history? Um, a couple other examples. Exodus 5, when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, they said, you know, let our people rest. And the word there is, let them Sabbath. Were they telling Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, I'm sorry, were they telling Pharaoh, okay, from now on, our people are going to observe the seventh day Sabbath? We don't know, but reading between the lines, it's probably what it meant. And then Exodus 16 is another example, uh, the, the man of the whole manna thing. What, what do we learn from the manna thing? Remember the manna was given and they were... Sabbath was different. Yeah. Sabbath. On Friday they were given a double portion mm -hmm. and it was preserved over until the next day, whereas other days if you try to keep it, what happened? Spoiled. It spoiled. So clearly God was involved in that and that went on for 40 years. Same kind of thing. But in the New Testament it never says keep the Sabbath. It, it doesn't it says mention, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Yes, by a model, and since we're his disciples. But as like, his custom. As his custom. Mm -hmm. 
But like you said, the Beatitudes are a restatement of the Ten Commandments. I don't see all the commandments there. No. The well, Hebrews 4 speaks yeah. about keeping Sabbath. Yeah. But exactly. there's nothing it's a, written it's about a whole Jesus Sabbath chapter. talking much about it. I know that um, uh, some Christians throw out Hebrew. They don't like Hebrew. They don't like Hebrews because it clearly refers to the Old Testament and suggests that the teachings of the Old Testament are still supposed to apply to Christians. Hebrews 4 says that let us strive to enter into that rest yeah. lest any of us fall short of the same example of the Israelites who also broke the Sabbath. Um, and it says let us strive to enter into that rest. He spoke on this wise on a certain day. Mm -hmm. And if he spoke on a certain day, then we are to keep that day even to this day holy. He yeah. says he would not... He would not have afterward spoken of another day. Mm. So Hebrews chapter 4 is a great new well, testament I, chapter of keeping the Sabbath holy, which proves it, didn't, it wasn't done away with. Mm. It's very interesting that um, if we go back to the Old Testament, we discover something that most people have no awareness of. If you look at carefully at Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you discover that Every single one of the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Tenth, has a death penalty connected to it. Let me show you an example. Mm. Look at Numbers 15. If an individual, I'm, I'm reading from Numbers 15, I'm going to start reading from 27. If an individual sins unintentionally, he is to offer a one-year-old female goat as a sin offering. At the altar, the priest shall perform the ritual of purification to purify the person from his sin. He will be forgiven. The same regulation applies to all who unintentionally commit a sin, whether they are native Israelites or resident foreigners. But any person who sins deliberately, now I won't ask you to make any personal confessions, but the most recent sins you've committed, were they deliberate or non, un, 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 unintentional? Whether he is a native or foreigner, I'm reading on, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt and he shall be put to death because he has rejected what the Lord said and has deliberately broken one of his commands. He is responsible for his own death, and if we had time, we would read on verses 32 to 36. that gives an example of a man who went out, collected sticks to make a fire on the Sabbath, and God says, Moses said, what are, what are we supposed to do? This guy broke the Sabbath. And God says, take him outside the camp, hand the people stones, stone him to death. How would things be today if we said anybody who breaks a, one of the Ten Commandments is to be stoned to death? There'd be plenty of room in church. I'm sorry? There'd be plenty of empty pews in yes. church. Yes. Well, uh, I And the think ones who came would pay a faithful tithe, right? I think so. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's talking about somebody like rich people that can pay for their sins, and they think that they can just, just sin whenever they want. What does that have to do with being stoned to death? Well, that's, God doesn't want that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you got, if you got uh, hundreds of sheep, mm -hmm. and you got, it's no big deal but to sacrifice pay, something. You can only pay for unintentional sins. You can't pay for no, I'm saying intentional that that's, sins, that you get stoned. A, that's what I'm saying, that, that the intentional sin is somebody who thinks he can buy his way out. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's what, God that's makes how it very I interpret. clear that you can't. Well, that's true. That's true, absolutely. But that's what I'm saying. You're kind of saying intentional like anybody. I mean, we've all done intentional sins. We'd all be dead the way you're identifying it. Don't, don't look at me. I'm reading to you from the Bible. No, no, no. I am reading from it, too, and I'm telling you the same thing. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> to me, the interesting thing is this still happens in certain parts of the world. Yes. Is this where they got it from? Mm -hmm. Probably. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, the Sabbath was only for the Jews. Isaiah 56 mm -hmm. totally combats that um, to give anybody who does believe today that the Sabbath was for the Jews. Isaiah 56 makes it clear that anybody who joins himself to the Lord is to turn away their foot. And if you go to Isaiah 66, Sabbath, it says we will be keeping the Sabbath for the rest for of eternity. eternity. Yeah. Well, I look at Sabbath keeping a little bit like those, those people you see on television at football games. You know, they got their face painted one half one color and the other half another color, and they got these weird hats on, the color of their team. I mean, they are identifying 
with the, the home team or the visiting team, but it's their team. There's no question about which side they are rooting for. Yeah. In this situation, it seems to me that the Sabbath is our, our sign. It's like wearing a, a ribbon for whatever, whatever issue that you are exercised about today. Uh, if you are on God's side, you keep mm -hmm. the Sabbath. If you are on Muhammad's side, you keep Friday. Mm -hmm. And if you are a sun worshiper, you keep Sunday. Okay. And we can choose sides. Mm -hmm. So what if you don't want to wear a ribbon? Like when I go to a football game, I don't wear a ribbon to any, any team because I don't want to. Well, if but I still know I still want my team to win, but I'm not wearing any ribbon. You're embarrassed. No, I'm not embarrassed. I, I, I just don't want to wear a ribbon. I, I don't think you can push the model that far. You yeah. don't have the courage of your convictions. Well, I don't know about that. I think, <laughs> I think um, that's a valid question. Well, you either because we were talking about life and death here. Mm -hmm. Either have the mark or the seal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's not, well, I'll pick one up if I go by town this evening and uh, uh, make my choice. No. You can't say, well, the, I don't really want to, God. This he is, says, well, then guess what? I'm not your God. I this, want to, this is like the This is more like the marriage feast where the guy didn't have the, the marriage garment on and got thrown out. Mm -hmm. he, he couldn't say, well, I don't want to wear it. And that's the Sabbath is going to be the same issue. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 48 gives us a little clue about how we should relate to some of these things. It says, the holy God of Israel, the Lord who saves you, says, I am the Lord your God. He who, I am the one who wants to teach you for your own good and direct you in the way you should go. If only you had listened to my commands, then blessings would have flowed for you like a stream that never goes dry. The, uh, victory would have come to you like the waves that roll on the shore. Your descendants would be as numerous as grains of sand, and I would have made sure they were never destroyed. And remember, this is at a time when the northern kingdom of, of, of Israel, it was called in those days, was being wiped out as, as Isaiah was speaking. And Psalms 119 says that God's rules, we should delight in them. Um, they, it, it says that the natural consequences, the, the punishments that result from breaking them are, are natural consequences. Uh, it's very clear that within a few we weeks after giving the commandments in Mount Sinai, the people were dancing drunk and naked around a golden fertility cult symbol. God seems to place more consequence on intentional sin versus unintentional. Yeah. Now, first of all, what is an unintentional sin? And if it's unintentional and you don't know you've done it, does, it, does that leave it to the community to report you that you have done a sin that you don't even know about? Or what is this difference between mm -hmm. unintentional and intentional? Because God seems to place a difference in these mm -hmm. two. Well, as I said, back in, in 1 John 3, 4, it says literally, sin is rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this, flying in the face of what you know God wants you to do and say, I want to do this, God, right now, I think that what I want to do is better than what you want me to do. Maybe that would be intentional. In this way, we know Jesus died for us. You know, and we, he died for every sin that we've ever committed. And if we continue to sin against that innocent blood, Jesus Christ, the Bible explains, there is no, there's nothing more he can do for us yeah. beyond that. We rebelled knowing there's a savior, knowing that we have an out through the grace of Christ, and yet we're abusing his grace to the extent that we possibly can by going and doing what we want to do anyway, knowing that somebody paid our price in our way to heaven. It was almost as if we don't appreciate the sacrifice it, it that seemed, it took on our behalf. So it's more, I think, it shows the true character and nature of our souls 
that we hate God, and He says in His commandments, punishing the uh, children up to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of them that keep my commandments and that love me. You know, that's the difference. Loving God or hating Him, knowing that there's been propitiation made on our behalf. Our road has been paved to heaven, and we can decide, knowing that, if we're going to continue in sin or if we're going to repent it and seems God it, help us. It seems like Jesus even died for us when we didn't, we don't even know we're sinning, that it's unintentional sin. That's, that's, that's exactly what it says in mm -hmm. Romans 5. Mm -hmm. There it is, right in the Bible. Now, the incredible thing is this. If you, if you turn to back to Exodus, our story of Mount Sinai, and you go to chapter nine, 19, I'm sorry, before the giving of the Ten Commandments, and look at verse 8, they haven't even, God hasn't even spoken yet. God has not even spoken yet. And what did they say? Then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. They hadn't even heard anything yet. Yeah, whatever God says, we'll just do it. Well, a few days later, we come to chapter 24, and Moses says, I, I, I think we better review those rules that God gave. So Moses went and told the people, I'm looking at Exodus 24, verse 3. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances, and all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses says, I'm still not sure you got it. So he wrote it down. And then he said, let me read it to you. So he read it to him. And then verse 7, then he took the book of the covenant in which the Lord's commands were written, and he read it aloud to the people. They said, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. And they did from then on, right? Do you think that they were so used to being slaves and doing what the Egyptians wanted and saying that, yes, yes, we will do it, yes, Master, so we won't get whipped? Mm -hmm. that that's why they answered this way? They, they were used to gods that were made out of metal and stone and things like this, and they figured whatever comes out of a god of metal or stone, we can handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've talked about the nature of law. What do we do with verses like Romans 13, 8 and 10? This is a classic verse for trying to understand what the law is all about. Romans 13, and I'm reading verses 8, 9, and 10. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not desire what belongs to someone else. Now, where did those commandments come from? Ten commandments. Yeah. Ten commandments, clearly. All these and any others besides are summed up in the one command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love then is to obey the whole law. So, what does that say to us about the lawgiver? I'll repeat what I said earlier in the okay. sense, of because it's right there. To love is to fulfill the law. And until we have that agape love, you know, which we, I feel we need to pray for to be in our hearts, it is going to be impossible to fulfill the law. Oh. Mm -hmm. when, when I read that, that statement, when I hear you read it, it to me, it says a one of God's characteristics that we need to acquire is God is not self-centered. Mm -hmm. God is not pulling puppet strings so that he gets anything he wants. When we obey the law with everybody else's best interest at heart, or when we live life with everybody's best interest at heart, mm -hmm. not just us, mm -hmm. you are automatically doing the Ten Commandments without a checklist. Mm -hmm. It's part of you to not be self-centered, but to do what's best for the everyone. Seventh-day Adventists have been given a kind of fresh revelation, a fresh look at Scripture through the writings of Ellen White. Mm -hmm. Are you thankful for that revelation? 
Oh, yes. Has it been a blessing to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. A do you a view... What? A blessing and a slap in the face. I <laughs> see. <laughs> do you view the th writings of Ellen White as something given for your own good mm -hmm. and well-being? Mm -hmm. What benefits have accrued to Seventh-day Adventist Church as, as a result of these special revelations? Does that have anything to do with our favorite town here? It's one of the blue zones mm -hmm. where people live comfortably to over 100 years of age. Mm -hmm. Does that have anything to do with the fact that those who follow the guidance we were given 100, and 100 plus years ago live on an average 12 years longer than the average population? Mm -hmm. Although it's no guarantee no, I mean, there's, there's still diseases that you can still get run over, you can still get mashed in a car wreck, and yeah, that's true. I would like to go beyond where our lesson goes and say that maybe one of the most important things we should have learned from Ellen White is what we, talk, what we call the Great Controversy. And the Great Controversy means that we believe that the conflict that's going on in the universe is over God's character and his government and how he runs his government. Mm -hmm. That Satan has made all sorts of accusations against God and God said, okay, 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 okay. I'm not gonna just answer back and say, I can shout louder than you can, Satan. You know, yes I can, yes I can, yes. And sa Satan says, no, no, no. And it's not, a sh it's not a shouting match. God says, I will take the time necessary to prove that every one of Satan's accusations was false. Dennis. I don't want to get into politics, mm -hmm. but I would like to take an example from politics, mm -hmm. whether you would favor Herman Cain being on the ballot mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Certain accusations were made against him, mm -hmm. which could not be proved. Mm -hmm. which he could not disprove. Mm -hmm. God is in almost the identical situation. Mm -hmm. We read of those accusations in Genesis 3, that God is not trustworthy, he's not acting in our best interest, that he has lied to us, and he's trying to keep us subordinated. How does especially, don't forget the one that's very clearly demonstrated that God is the one who kills those who don't, that sin, God says, death is a natural consequence of sin. The devil says, no it's not, and eventually he says, the reason sinners die is because God is killing them. So, how does God answer those charges? Mm -hmm. Now, Herman Cain doesn't have 6,000 years or more no. to say, look and follow me around, but God does. Mm -hmm. And God says, okay, those are the charges. I will create people on this rock called Earth that will have limited and expanded capacities, capabilities. Mm -hmm. And we will see if, if I'm really like the person Satan has made me out to be, mm -hmm. we will see who's the liar. Mm -hmm. Now it may take 6,000 years, but in the end, it will be demonstrated. It will be demonstrated. And those who are alive after the third coming will look back and say, Amen. Amen. That God told the truth, that Satan lied, mm -hmm. and we don't want any part of that experience again. Mm -hmm. So without the great controversy, we have a hard time sometimes explaining God's behavior. There are many parts of Scripture that I don't have any idea how you would give a rational explanation for them without an understanding of the Great Controversy. Well, didn't uh, Ellen White herself say that um, that was the most valuable? Um, she most calls, yeah, she calls the, her most her five volume most important set the Conflict of the Ages, and the last one of those is called the Great Controversy. Well, really. It's a matter of either putting yourself in the middle of the table and saying, Jesus did all this for my salvation and human being's salvation. And the great controversy is putting God in the middle of the table 
and saying, all this is because of God and who he is. And, and I'm um, part of that, but I'm not in the center of the table God is. Yeah. Most people, maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's incorrect. Maybe that's a, an overreach. A lot of people do not need a rational explanation. Religion God is... God has said it and I believe it and that's all there is to it. To turn the page and it says just the opposite and they have no explanation and they merely say, I, I have no problem with that. That is a very schizophrenic view of God. But if you can put it in this setting of the great controversy and come to grips with God's agenda, his objective. His objective is at beyond the third coming, that harmony will be restored and the earth will now be more stable. The earth, the entire universe will be in a more stable state than, than could have existed prior to Satan's rebellion. I'm going to challenge all of us here, not to discuss this because this would be too personal, and all of you out there watching, to think, can you think of an experience, of personal experience, or of someone that's close to you who has literally experienced the disastrous consequences of sin? <laughs> yeah, okay. That was enough of a response, I think. <laughs> that's, I why, that's why the public schools have continuation school. Yeah. Well, do you think all the Ten Commandments are still relevant to Christians today? Yes. Could we keep the Ten Commandments and still be free? Yeah. <laughs> you can't be free without. Yeah. I quote once again from Ellen White. This is Desire of Ages, uh, start, uh, page 466 the book that talks about the life of Christ. In the work of redemption, there is no compulsion. No external force is employed. Under the influence of the Spirit of God, man is left free to choose whom he will serve. And the change that takes place when the soul surrenders to Christ, there is a highest sense of freedom. Now that's a, that's a it's an oxymoron. Oxymoron. You surrender, but you're free. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. True, we have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control, but when we desire to be set free from sin, and in our great need cry out for a power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imbued with divine energy of the Holy Spirit, and they obey the dictates of the will in fulfilling the will of God. The only condition under which the freedom of man is possible, now we're back to the freedom thing, the only condition under which the freedom of man is possible is that of becoming one with Christ. The truth shall make you free. You remember the famous discussion Jesus had with the Sadducees and the Pharisees there, and that must have been, you know, I just, when I think about that John 8 discussion, I wonder what the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought when they went home that night. You know, here they are standing in the very presence of God, and he says three times to them, I am. And finally he says, you don't get it, do you? And then he says, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, so that's what you meant. <laughs> you know, how would you, what, what would you say after having a heated argument, accusing this guy of being a son of the devil, and you find out that he's claiming to be God? You'd be mumbling blasphemy all the way home. Well, Christ goes on. He is the truth. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind and destroying the liberty of the soul. Subjection to God is restoration to oneself, to the true glory and dignity of man. Notice that subjection to God, now that sounds like we've lost our liberty, doesn't it? Is restoration to oneself, to the true glory and dignity of man. And I will remind you that Galatians 5.23, remember the, the fruit of the Spirit? I won't read all of 22, 
but when we get to 23, the part of that is humility and self-control. Do you ever feel compromised, put upon, uh, degraded when you do what the glove compartment box says, <laughs> put gas in the gas tank? Does that give you some kind of feeling of confinement? Mm -hmm. Or does that give you the freedom to run your car? And you push on the gas pedal and it goes whim. Right. <laughs> but if you read those two paragraphs to the postmodern personality, their eyes will glaze over and they will say, just so much wasted oxygen. What did Paul say? You know, what, what the world considers rubbish. Foolish. And what you know, it's 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 the other way around. How 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 do you convey yeah. th those sentiments to our to our postmodern neighbors? Yes. Well, what do we consider freedom? Mm -hmm. Would freedom be living forever, or becoming ashes? Ashes doesn't sound like real freedom to me. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can't really have true freedom without sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's kind of a balance there between those two because if you if you have freedom like Satan wants, look what what there's the no kind freedom of it's not Satan freedom. Wants. Come on, it's you can you can go freedom. you can go do anything you want. You can drink if you want. You can go destroy yourself go to in the win. process. Well, and you call that freedom. Well, it's still freedom. Well, that's what she was talking about. You call freedom you call ashes freedom. Well, look at how can you how can you be not selfish? if you don't do sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You've well, got to have that. We're, yeah. we're, we're running out of time, so let's see if we can conclude. God's laws, when they're understood correctly, are really a guide to living the free life. Mm -hmm. It means you can live another way, but sooner or later you're going to smack up into some serious consequences. And it's going to have serious implications for you. But if you choose to live according to God's plan, you can do whatever you want because you'll never choose to do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And that kind of a life is the kind of life you can live from now throughout eternity. Try it. See you next week.